Let's bless his name together. Baruch Hu et Adonai HaMevorach Baruch Adonai HaMevorach Le'olam Ba'ed Blessed be the Lord who is blessed. Blessed be the Lord who is blessed forever and ever. Amen. From Devarim, Deuteronomy 6, the cornerstone of our faith. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Le'olam Va'ed Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Praise be his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever. Amen. And when Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what is the most important command? He answered with the words of the Shema and said the following. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you this day shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah then said, the second command is like unto the first, the ahafta l'recha kamocha, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we're going to be doing something a little bit different here today. Our first song is going to be a new song. It's, I just picked up my new album yesterday. So that is here, and we're going to do a song from it called The Greatest Command, which is referring to the portion that we just read with the Shema and the Via Hafta. And so we're going to do that now. The Greatest Command. When Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what's the most important command? He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself as you take it to the fullest length. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, love your neighbor as yourself. And the words which he commanded shall be deep within our heart so he can make his presence known never to depart. Everything the Lord commands us rests on these two things. So do what's right as he commands in everything that he brings. Love the Lord and love your name. Messiah was asked the question, Rabbi, what's your greatest insight? 
He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself as you take it to the highest height. They are hot to the wreck of Kamocha. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yes, love your neighbor as yourself. And the words which he commanded shall be deep within our heart. So we can be completely changed and get a brand new start. Yes, and everything the Lord commands rests on these two things. So do what's right as he commands in everything that he brings. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. And everything will be all right. Yes, love the Lord and love your neighbor. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. Love the Lord and love your neighbor. And everything else will be just fine. Baruch Hashem. Everything will be just fine if we get those two things in order. And partially what it does is it sets up the foundation. It says on these two things, everything, all of the Torah rests. And a lot of times it's a matter of getting our thoughts in mind, what we think about, what we meditate on, what is a part of our focus that will translate into how we interact with the Lord and with people around us. So we're going to continue with the song, Think on These Things. When I'm worn and weary and don't know what to do, when everything around me says that I won't make it through, then I remember the simple words that you had said to me. And I rise above every challenge and walk in victory. And you said, think on these things, think on these, yes, think on these. We have to think on these things, whatever is true, whatever is worthy, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is good, with virtue and excellence. Think on these things, think on these, yes, think on these, just think on these. Anxious for nothing, but in everything learn to pray. Give thanks to God in all things, so in Messiah's love you'll stay. And this peace that transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind, and fear will have to flee. And he said, think on these things, think on these, just think on these, just think on these. Whatever is true, whatever is honored, whatever is right, and all that is pondered, whatever is good, with all that is excellent Think on these Just Think on things. these, these. Yes, think on these 
just think on these. We've got to think on these. Just think on these. Think, think on these. Yes, think on these things. Just think on. You know, the topic today where the spies went into the land and the title for today is what do you see and what do you say? And what we meditate on has a strong impact on what we say and how we interpret what we see. And sometimes, you know, you see some giants in the land, you can get pretty fearful. But the fact is, God says, why should you fear? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. And he says, be anxious for nothing. And God wants us to be able to go through things that we don't know what the end result is going to be. But we know who we're with, and he will bring us through with victorious results. And so, here we go. Why should we fear? If God before us, who can be against us? If God is for us, why live in despair? If God is for us, doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we have no need to fear. And if God who provides, everything is for us. Why focus any longer on what we lack without Him? Oh yes, if God who provides, Everything is for us. Why focus any longer on what we lack without Him? So draw near, don't delay. Turn your heart towards Him today. Yes, draw near and obey. Walk with Him and just say, If God before us, who can be against us if God is for us why do we live in despair if God is for us it doesn't matter who's against us if God is for us we don't need to fear oh yeah if God is for us who can be against us when God is for us he shows us he cares and when people ask me how am I doing I answer back and I say, it's always better than I know and getting better every day. Cause God goes beyond what I think or imagine and that is why I boldly say, if God before us, who can be against us? If God is for us, why choose to live in despair? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we don't need to fear. So draw near, don't delay. Turn your heart towards Him today. Yes, draw near and obey. Walk with Him and just say, God before us. Who can be against us if God is for us? Why choose to live in despair? If God is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. If God is for us, we don't need to fear. Oh yes, if God is for us, who can be against us? When God is for us, he shows us his care. As we rise above every fear. Praise the name of the Lord. He helps us to rise above every fear. So why should we go into despair? There's no reason to. He's provided everything we need to fully equip us for the task that he sets before us. For this life that we have. If he is for us and provides everything we need, why worry about what we would lack without him? It doesn't make any sense. We need to always focus 
on him and what he has called us to do and let him have his way. Shabbat Shalom. Sabbath peace to you. We welcome everyone to Beth Sion. We're so glad you're here with us in person. And for those who are watching on the broadcast, we're glad to have you along as well and ask you to come on out and visit with us in person as well so that we can experience your face. You see our face. We can't see your face. So come on out and we'll look forward to seeing you. Our calling as a congregation is to declare Messiah to the Jewish heart of central Jersey and to share the truth of Yeshua through Jewish eyes. This has been our calling since Marlene and I came to the congregation to share the truth of Yeshua, to put back in context all the things that Yeshua said and did and to understand it through Jewish eyes because everything he did was in, in coordination with the Torah. He never contradicted the Torah. He never challenged or questioned it. He questioned sometimes the man-made rules and regulations that people came up with, but he always went to the heart of the issue and wants to bring transformation in the hearts of people everywhere. And the wonderful thing is that as we see the new covenant in context through Jewish eyes, we understand the words of Yeshua and the power that it brings that much more, the transforming work that his word can do in our lives. And we want to see God reach out to the communities around us and draw people to himself and make his power and presence known. He said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And he is the way, the truth and the life. And he wants us to experience the fullness of what it means to know him and to have fellowship with one another. We have our basket in the back for Hamaser Vahatruma for the 10th, the tithes and the offering. You can fill out an envelope if you won't need a record. You can also visit our website at bethzion.org and use PayPal there. Or you can mail to Beth Zion, P.O. Box 807, Jackson, New Jersey, 08527. And we appreciate all of your prayer, your support, and for the way that God is knitting us together as a people to reach out to the communities around us and see God do exploits in our midst. We get to participate. We don't create the action, but God knows how to do that. He's got a good track record, so we're going to leave that in his hands but we're going to ask that we make ourselves available to him to be able to impact these communities that we live in and that are around us. This week on Tuesday, we are not having our Zoom meeting, our Havara group meeting on Tuesday, because uh, I will be at the conference and uh, others who may be at the conference. But also, if you would like, you can stream the evening program on Tuesday at the conference and uh, experience that uh, in your living room. It won't be interactive, but it'll be something to activate you for service and for more things. So it'll be a blessing for you to do that. You can go to mjaa.org or Messiah 2024, and I believe they have the links there online to be able to see the evening programs in streaming for the whole week and for the Saturday morning service as well. Uh, that will be online as well that you can take that in. But please, please, if you're here, please come to service next Saturday because I am driving back Friday night to be here for service on Saturday and uh, then driving back to the conference right afterwards. So I look forward to seeing everybody here, and it will be a blessing. We look forward to it. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father and our King, we thank you for this time in your word. We ask you to open up our hearts to receive what you have for us and that we will be able to be equipped by your spirit to do wonderful things in our communities and the people that you bring in our path. We thank you, Lord. Have your way today. Let Messiah be lifted up, drawing all people to yourself. In Yeshua's name, amen. Well, today's portion is called Shlach Lecha, 
which means send on your behalf. And this is from Bamidbar, Numbers, chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. And here in verse 1, it's where they were sending out the 12 spies into the land to survey the land and to get a feel for what it is that is going on. There's a lot more to that, which we'll go into another time. But the fact is that they were sent, and, and it says, the Lord said to Moshe, send men on your behalf to survey the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each ancestral tribe, send someone who is a leader in his tribe. Now, that's interesting because last week he talked about where God set up 70 people to help assist Moses to allow the anointing to come upon them to do service in the community, to work with the 50s and with the hundreds and with all the different people so that all the people were being taken care of. And it's interesting that he references to take from each tribe, someone who was a leader in his tribe. Now, that's significant because from each tribe, they list who that person was. And aside from two of the people, most people never heard of any of the others. And there's a good reason for that. But the two that we do know are Joshua and Caleb. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb. And that's because they stood out from the crowd and they were positive in their report back to the people. But as you go through this, you see this story over and over again. And I think it brings up something. I said, we're calling this, what do you see and what do you say? Because clearly they saw, all of them saw the, the wonder of what the land produced, what it had there available. They saw the, during the 40 days that they were journeying through and surveying the land, they were taking in all of that. They brought back samples of the grapes, and you've probably seen those images. In fact, it's one of the symbols of Israel where they have the two men walking with a pole and a large cluster of grapes coming back. That's not the cluster you buy in the supermarket, I don't think, but it's a large cluster. And you see that image as they brought back the fruit of the land to validate the fact that God was indeed giving them a land that flows with milk and honey that was a land that would be beneficial and fruitful for them. But what you see happening there was two people, Joshua and Caleb, had a different vision. They saw something different or evaluated what they saw differently than the other 10 did. The other 10, all they could do was be consumed with the fact that they saw giants in the land. They saw people. It says in one place, we were as grasshoppers in our sight, and so we were in theirs. And they saw themselves as insignificant, as somebody who could be crushed because these people were so big and powerful and had forgotten what it was that God just did. None of these people, none of these towns, cities, or people would compare to the military might of the Egyptians. And yet God, by his mighty hand, brought deliverance for our people out of Egypt and destroyed the military operation of Egypt. Certainly, he would be able to, if they thought it through, take care of these cities and these places where they were going. But they allowed themselves to be sidetracked. And, you know, in this image that we have here on the screen, you've got people talking in, to each other and dialoguing with each other. And when people do that, they don't just simply present facts. They also present the color that comes with their interpretation of what it means, the spin that goes on it. And many times it's not the actual details of what happened that is most significant. What makes a difference is what the spin on it is. And if there's a negative spin, and this was sad because even though Joshua and Caleb tried to resolve 
the impact that these other 10 people had with their negative report. They were unable to turn the tide. They were unable to get the people to rationally think through and logically understand what God was doing. They said, we're well able to take this nation. We're well able to take the land. Don't do this. But they couldn't help themselves. The fear had gripped their hearts and they were unable to understand fully what was going on. The men were sent on behalf of the people to bring back the report. And at first, their report was good. They said, it's definitely a land that is rich and wonderful. However, and they brought a negative report to discourage the people. Did you ever notice how you could be feeling great? I've given these examples before, but you could be feeling just wonderful on top of the world. And somebody looks at you and just notices the color of your shirt and says, that's not really your color, is it? And the insecurity that suddenly swells up, the fact that you say, you, you know, you might say to your spouse, I, I think I want to go change my shirt. Why? It looks great. No, I, I, I think I, there, it, it has a way of undermining our confidence in what we're presenting ourselves to be. And when you start talking amongst yourselves, <laughs> when we start to hear the chatter of what people are interpreting circumstances to be, we never know what the final impact is going to be. If it's going to be a word of encouragement or if it's going to be a word of discouragement, it, we need to be able to be people who encourage one another, who are there standing in the gap to make a difference for people. One of the things that we see in this, of course, is that they said our children, they're going to be wiped out. We should have got, we should have never left Egypt. We should go back again. And they even wanted to hire somebody to lead them, to bring them back. Can you imagine what Pharaoh would have thought if he sees them coming? He goes, no, no, keep them away. Put up a wall. Keep them out. Don't let them come across the border. <laughs> it would have been devastating. You know, what would you do? Come back and say, we'd like our old jobs back, <laughs> which was slaves. What would they, they're, they're not there's a what happens is we're impacted by the words and the way people say and interpret what they see. But we need to be able to always see the way God sees it. We need to be able to see it through God's eyes, through what his word declares that he is doing in our behalf. And when they when they did this, it's interesting, too, that a little while later, uh, they were talking about the, the giants in the land. Verse 33 says, We saw the Nephilim, the descendants of Anak, who was from the Nephilim to ourselves. We looked like grasshoppers by comparison. And we looked that way to them too. Well, what's interesting is later on when we come to the book of Joshua and you see what was going on from the time that they heard about what had happened in Egypt, the people in the land were petrified of this nation coming out, these people coming out. So for 40 years, they were scared and fearful of this nation, these Jewish people coming into the uh, just across the river, you know, and they, they were waiting and 40 years of consternation and fear. And yet in the mind of the people themselves, they said, we were like grasshoppers. We looked like grasshoppers by comparison. To ourselves, we looked like grasshoppers. And we looked that way to them too. That we looked like them, like that way to them too, was an interpretation that they were making. They were assuming that they viewed them that way. But we find out when the two spies went into the land later, 40 years later, they heard the fear that was in the people and the fact that they were waiting for the next shoe to drop or sandal to drop or whatever it was you'd call it back then. But they were looking and, and it, was, it, was, it was pretty amazing because their view of themselves 
was shaped by the words of discouragement that the spies brought back and their ability to understand what the reality was that God was calling them to be a nation, to be a people, that he would walk in the midst of them. All of these things that he wanted to accomplish and do. And they were unable to allow the chatter to stop. They were unable to filter out the words of man and the discouraging words and listen to what God's promise was. Now, we may look at it and say, how could they have done that? But look, in all honesty, all of us have done that at different times. We looked at our circumstances and we said, I don't see how I can do anything with this. Or we look at it and say, well, it's one thing to trust the Lord, but, you know, this needs somebody to come in who's a professional. <laughs> well, God has been in the restoration business for a long time, and he knows best how to do that. But when we allow ourselves to be sidetracked by the words and by the actions of others and the interpretation of the facts by others, we put ourselves in a position where we see ourselves diminished now, it's not that we would puff ourselves up. That also diminishes us. <laughs> when you put your, puff yourself up in your own eyes, that's a diminishing as well because your reality is based on what you see and how you see yourself. And that may or may not be true because we'd have to ask that question. What do you see? I see that we could never take them. They're all giants. I see the circumstances are beyond Anything we could imagine God could come in and do. I mean, that's basically what they were saying, but they weren't thinking through. What do you say? You start to repeat and start to generate in your words what you're feeling in your heart. And it has an effect on us that isolates us from seeing the plan of God unfold. And so when we look at it, uh, there are so many interesting things about, it. you know, it ends this section with chapter 15, the end of chapter 15. And it's interesting that there it says this. It talks about the tzitzit, the, the fringes. And what was it that he was doing? You know, I, I should say this first. When they realized that God said, okay, for the 40 days you're going to spend one year for each day. It'll be 40 years. Your bodies will die in the wilderness, but your children will go in and take possession of the land. And then they said, OK, we, we changed our mind. We'll go in and do it. He says, no, don't you. You've you've missed the window. It's not for you to do. God says, don't do it. They said, no, no, we'll do it. And they were defeated. They rent to do it and they were defeated because it wasn't, they had already violated that and God already made a decision about it. And so all of this, it's kind of interesting that what he does at the end of chapter 15 is it says in verse 38, the Lord said to Moses, speak to the people of Israel, instructing them to make through all their generations tzitzit, fringes, on the corners of their garments and to put with it tzitzit on each corner a blue thread. It is to be a tzitzit for you to look at and thereby remember all of Hashem's mitzvot and obey them so that you won't go around wherever your own heart and eyes lead you to prostitute yourselves. But it will help you remember and obey all my mitzvot and be holy for your God. I am Hashem, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt in order to be your God. I am the Lord, your God. And it was this reminder, like tying a string around your finger to remember something. In this case, the fringes were to remind them not to follow their own impulses, to follow their own way of doing things, their own heart and eyes, which lead them astray, literally into prostitution. It's amazing the depravity that will come when we start to isolate ourselves from the things that God says to do. And when we start to veer off and blur the boundaries and eventually violate all those boundaries, we find ourselves in big trouble. And so it's interesting that he concludes this with the reference to the tzitzis, with the fringes. 
as a reminder. What's also interesting is next week's portion, we'll talk about that next week, but next week's portion is called, called Korah. And what's interesting is that in the Orthodox Jewish community, when they talk about the rebellion of Korah, you know what they reference as his sin was? He made his sitsis the wrong way. Because the verse right before you come to the chapter on Korah and his rebellion was talking about the fringes. Now, in some ways, it may be true, not because of his fringes. He was focused on himself. He was focused on what he wanted. And really, when you look at this last week's portion and all the different things that we see happening, there are those slippages that happen. There are those, those variations off the path that causes rebellion, that causes a separation from the things that God says he wants for his people. And so this was a physical display for the people to be reminded to follow and obey the Lord in his commandments, his mitzvot. And so we see all of those different things there, and we'll go into more of that later. But in the book of Hebrews, he says this in reference to it. It says, therefore, as the Ruach HaKodesh says, verse 7 of chapter 3 of Hebrews, today if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the bitter quarrel on the day in the wilderness when you put God to the test. Yes, your fathers put me to the test. They challenged me and they saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was disgusted with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not understood how I do things. In my anger, I swore that they would not enter my rest. Watch out, brothers. And this is what's interesting is that here in Hebrews, he's giving not just the facts of what took place, but illustration as to how to make application. He says, watch out, brothers, so that there will not be in any of you, one of you, any one of you, an evil heart lacking trust of unbelief, which could lead you to apostatize from the living God. Not just talking about apostatize or remove yourself from the lifestyle of the community, but to actually separate yourself from the Lord and all the things that he wants to do. The living God wanting to be among us. Instead, keep exhorting each other every day. There is the encouragement, cheerleaders for one another, exhorting one another each day as long as it is called today so that none of you will become hardened by the deceit of sin. For we have become sharers in the Messiah, provided, however, that we hold firmly to the conviction we began with right through until the goal is reached. So when do we ease up on it? Not until the goal is reached. Not when we're saying, well, you know, I feel so good. Everything is fine. So I can play around the borders just a little bit. No, no, no. We need to understand that God wants us to go all the way with the plan that he has for us. He says that we hold firmly to the conviction. What's interesting, too, is that a lot of times people will refer to it as greasy grace. You know, that's where grace is a powerful gift that God has given us. But sometimes people diminish its value by making it to cover things in ways it wasn't meant to. So he says, for we become sharers of the Messiah, not just a doctrinal position, but sharers of the Messiah provided, however, what is the provision? What is the little catchphrase that's so important here to become sharers of the Messiah provided, however, that you hold firmly to the conviction we began, we began with right through until the goal is reached. There is a perseverance that God wants us to have to press in and take hold of what God made available to us. He says, now, where it says, today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as you did in the bitter quarrel. Who were the people who, after they heard, quarreled so bitterly? 
Who were they? All those who Moses brought out of Egypt. All those who experienced the deliverance power of God. And who were the ones who lost it? The ones who were delivered but didn't understand the value of what that deliverance meant, didn't understand what it was actually all about. And with whom was God disgusted for 40 years? Those who sinned, yes, they fell dead in the wilderness. And to whom was it that he swore that they would not enter his rest? Those who were disobedient. So we see that they were unable to enter because of a lack of trust, because of unbelief. And then just the two verses in chapter 4 that follows. Therefore, let us, because therefore is always important because you find out what it's there for. Therefore, let us be terrified of the possibility that even though the promise of entering his rest remains, any one of you might be judged to have fallen short of it. For good news has also been proclaimed to us, just as it was to them. But the message they heard didn't do them any good because those who heard it did not combine it with trust. Combine it with faith. It's one thing to have the promise. But if you don't believe or trust the one who has promised, the value of that promise is diminished in our own minds. And we find ourselves substituting something else. For it is we who have trusted who enter into that rest. This is something so wonderful that we have to keep in mind. We have to be vigilant in everything that we do to be able to understand what it is that God is doing. You know, it's interesting, too, that it doesn't take a lot. It takes the development of a relationship that continues to expand and grow. You know, he says in Luke 17, Yeshua said to his Tamadim, verse 1, It is impossible that snares will not be set, but woe to the person who sets them. People do set snares all the time, traps for people. Why? I don't know. Part of human nature, the dark side. But then it says, verse 2, It would be to his advantage that he have a millstone hung around his neck and he be thrown into the sea rather than that he ensnare one of these little ones. Watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Also, if seven times in one day he sins against you and seven times he comes to you and says, I repent, you are to forgive him. The emissary said to the Lord, increase our trust, increase our faith. It's interesting because what he just described sounded impossible. He said it's impossible that snares will not be set. But he's not saying that the snares will overtake you. He's saying what they're saying is forgive them. If they repent seven times in the day, accept it. Forgive them. And they said increase our faith. Increase our trust. That's a big one. The Lord replied, if you have trust as tiny as a mustard seed, you could say to this fig tree, be uprooted and replanted in the sea and it will obey you. There is this idea that what seems impossible, faith, trust can be very small. But if it's that seed inside that is the potential, the possibilities of what can grow from it. And so it's something that he describes in the way of faith. In Luke 10, there's an interesting situation that happens. He does send out 70 into the field. In fact, he says in chapter 10, verse 1 of Luke, after this, the Lord appointed 70 other Talmudim and sent them on ahead in pairs to every town and place where he himself was about to go. And what's interesting is it says, he said to them, to be sure there is a large harvest, but there were few workers. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest that he 
Speed workers out to gather in the harvest. Get going now, but pay attention. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money belt or a pack. And I love this translation. And don't stop to schmooze with the people on the road. I understand they changed this to be more accurate afterwards and took out schmooze because they didn't speak Yiddish back then. Well, it's not a question of if they spoke Yiddish back then. The term schmooze, to talk comfortably uh, with somebody, and, and it captures the intensity of what he's saying here. Don't get sidetracked by having enough funds or by stopping to schmooze and talk lightly with people along the way. I, I could think also they're going out and they're seeing people healed and delivered, and maybe they are having dialogue with one another. Say, yeah, we I went and prayed for this guy, and his eyes were open. He was healed, blind. And he says, yeah, well, we did something. He was deaf. They, they heard. And this other one, he couldn't walk. And he was, well, that's it. We, we did something. It was two legs. We, you know, I mean, it's like they could waste their time talking among themselves and not be accomplishing the purpose and plan of God. And we can sometimes talk about what we've done and what we're accomplishing and in so doing be sidetracked enough that we miss doing what we're called to do. We're not called to talk about what we do. We're not called to talk about what we could do. We're called to do what God says to do and to trust in him and to have faith to believe and to see all these things. And what's interesting here is that in this chapter, it says that there were a large multitude that were there. And he gives this order to them. And then in Mark 9, it's similar situation. But in Mark 9, in verse, in verse 14, it says that when they got back to the Talmudim, they saw a large crowd around them and some Torah teachers arguing with them. As soon as the crowd saw him, they were surprised and ran out to greet him, Messiah. He asked, what's the discussion about? What are you schmoozing about? One of the crowd gave him the answer. Rabbi, I brought my son to you because he has an evil spirit in him that makes him unable to talk. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him on the ground and he goes on with this. He says, and, and, and he says, I asked your Talmudim, your disciples, to drive out the spirit, but they couldn't do it. And then these words, people without any trust, he responded. How long will I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Be, bring him to me. They brought the boy to him, and as soon as the spirit saw him, it threw the boy on the ground into convulsions. Yeshua answered, asked the boy's father, how long has this happened to him? Ever since childhood, he said. And he cast him out, and it was pretty remarkable. The boy laid there like a corpse so that the, most of the people said, he's dead. There again, you see, what you see is not always what it is. But what you see could influence the whole crowd. If they said, oh, he killed him, he looked, he prayed for him, he cast, and nothing happened, and the kid's dead now. They were starting to develop a little rumor because they thought they saw something that wasn't the case. They saw him laying there, but they put their spin on it. They said, they didn't say he might be dead. They said most of the people said he was dead. But Yeshua took him by the hand, raised him to his feet, and he stood up. And then later, the private discussion he had with his disciples, because they were supposed to go out and do this, and this was a situation that they couldn't handle. It says in verse 28, after Yeshua had gone indoors, his Talmudim asked him privately, why couldn't we drive him out? He said to them, this is the kind of spirit that can be driven out only by prayer. And there is something that requires a lifestyle, a lifetime of interaction with God, of praying, of being in union with him, of 
watching and you know some translations will say of prayer and fasting but some people might see the idea of fasting as what we do to get the power to do it. It isn't. It's the prayer that makes the difference. It's the relationship that we have with him that is most important. There's value in fasting, but the power that God is speaking about was the lack of prayer and the lack of communicating with God. Why couldn't we drive them out? You did it so easy. You made it look so easy. <laughs> but, um, you know, these are, these are some of the things that, that happen. You know, I want to mention just a couple other verses before we close. And that is in, uh, in John 21. In John 21, there is this situation where Yeshua is approaching his disciples, and it says, after breakfast, Yeshua said to Shimon Kepha, this is after Messiah had been risen, he said, Simon bar Yochanan, son of John, do you love me more than these? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. He said to him, feed my lambs. Second time, he said to him, Shimon bar Yochanan, do you love me? He replied, yes, Lord, you know I'm your friend. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. The third time he approached him, he said, are you my friend? Shimon was hurt that he questioned him a third time. Are you my friend? So he replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I'm your friend. Yeshua said to him, feed my sheep. Yes, indeed, I tell you, when you were younger, you put on your clothes, you went where you wanted but when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which Kepha, Peter, would bring glory to God. Then Yeshua said to him, follow me. Everything focuses on following him. Everything focuses on the command to meet out to the people what they need, that God will provide all of that. But he's telling him, and it's interesting, they use the, in this translation, they use the term, do you love me? And then I, you know, I'm your friend. And then he says, it's a different word that he uses. And then the third time he says, are you my friend? And it was trying to convey also the value of what he's talking about, what love described by Yeshua is to lay down your life for your brother, to lay down, to love the same way he loved us, so love one another. All of these things are a part of it. What do you see? Do you see something as impossible? Do you see something as beyond the scope of what you can do? That's okay. But if you look at it and start to think it's beyond the scope of what God will do, you may find yourself outside the camp in some way. You want to be inside so that what you do see affects what you say. Because whatever it is you think you're seeing, you will address it in the way that you understand it. But God wants us to understand more deeply what it means so that we can see what God is doing and not be shaken by those things. You know, he says, again, in that passage in John, towards the end, <laughs> it says, Kepha turned and saw the Talmud Yeshua especially loved following him. This was Yochanan, John. The one who had leaned against him at the Seder or at the supper and had asked, who is the one who is betraying you? On seeing him, Kepha said to Yeshua, Lord, what about him? Yeshua said to him, if I want him to stay on until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. And it's kind of interesting because here's another rumor that started to develop. It says, verse 23, therefore, the word spread among the brothers that that Tamid would not die. He's talking about now John is not going to die. 
However, Yeshua didn't say he wouldn't die, but simply, if I want him to stay on until I come, what is that to you? And what is so important is to understand that Peter just got this deep instruction from Messiah. He's telling him even what kind of a death he'll experience. He's telling him all of this and telling him the important commission to feed the sheep, to feed the lambs, to minister to them. <laughs> and he sees John and he says, well, what about him? He, he already was distracted from his commission to wonder what kind of commission John had. And so he says, if he stays alive till I come, what's that to you? And they, somebody else listening said, oh, he's saying that John's not going to die. Now, it's not what he was saying. But again, it's so easy to be distracted by what we think we see, what we think we hear, and then we begin to verbalize with everybody else what we think it means. We have to be careful, you know, in the world we're living in today, isn't that pretty much the way the political things work and the way news organizations work? They throw the spin on it. You know, a lot of times, you know, I remember, you know, we just, there was just a debate that happened. But I remember they said of the Nixon-Kennedy debate, they said that if you saw the debate, it was the first televised debate, and yeah, and and Nixon was sweating, just sweating. And of course, John Kennedy looked handsome and and well groomed and all of that. And they said that it was devastating how Kennedy won that debate. But people listening to the debate on the radio, they said it was overwhelming. Nixon killed him in the debate. What was the difference? What they saw and how they interpreted what they saw. When we look at a lot of times, that's why sometimes when I watch debates, I like to watch it on one of the, um, what's it called, um, C-SPAN? Because you can watch it without any of the dialogue going on with it. You watch and evaluate what happened without the spin. Then you can watch and see later on what other people are saying. But it's amazing how powerful it is or how powerful it can be. So what we say is often directed by what we think we see or what by others chatter to us that it meant. And we need to be mindful of all of that so that we don't get sidetracked from what's most important. He said, what is that to you? You follow me. Him I'll deal with. But it's none of your business. Really. And if it is any of our business, it's to encourage each one of us to do what God has called us to do. To follow the way that God is calling us to follow him. That makes a difference. So what we see is God working in the hearts of people. What we see is the commission God's given us to bring the good news to others, to see us able to reach out and set captives free. And what do we say? They should be words of encouragement. They should be words that bring transformation in the hearts of people everywhere. He says this in the, and this is what we'll close with, 1 Peter 5 where he tells them not to be machers, you know, big bosses, domineering over those in your care, but as people who become examples to the flock. Our lives need to exemplify what it is that God is doing in our life. Then when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive glory as your unfaded crown. He says, God opposes the arrogant. But to the humble, he gives grace. Therefore, and again, that's important because here's the mandate. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God so that at the right time, he may lift you up. Throw all your anxieties 
upon him because he cares for you. Be anxious for nothing. Throw all your anxieties upon him because he's willing to take it because he cares for you. And then he says this, and this really is what helps us to discern what it is we see and what it is we say. He says in verse 8 of Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, stay sober, stay alert. Your enemy, the adversary, stalks about like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Stand against him, firm in your trust, knowing that your brothers throughout the world are going through the same kind of suffering. And he's telling them to be strong, be sober, be vigilant, be alert, so that you are mindful of what is going on around you and that you won't be influenced by influencers on chat talks and things of that nature, that we won't be influenced by it, but we will allow God to be our influencer, to be the one who leads us, his spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. We're so grateful for what God makes available, and we need to be walking with sobriety before him. And, you know, stay sober doesn't mean just don't drink. <laughs> It means don't be intoxicated by the words and by the actions and by the interpretations of what people say. Follow what God says. Be alert to the, the wiles of the adversary. He's telling him, be alert, be sober. Why? Your enemy, the adversary, stalks about looking for someone to devour. We need to know that we are on the menu for somebody out there. If we're not careful, we should be sober and be vigilant, be alert to follow what we hear and see the Father doing, to listen to the dictates of his spirit ministering to us and preparing us in so many ways. You know, I just end with this one thing. One of the things that we have coming up later in August is uh, Tisha B'Av. Well, you know what the first event that they say traditionally happened on Tisha B'Av? Was the evil report that the spies brought back to the people, the ninth of Av. The resulting was that for the 40 days, they spent 40 years in the wilderness. And all through history, the destruction of both temples was on Tisha B'Av. The start of World War I was on Tisha B'Av. The expulsion from England of the Jews was on Tisha B'Av in 12-something. The expulsion of the Jews in 1492 from Spain was on Tisha B'Av. It is the saddest day of the Jewish calendar. And this event is what they consider to be the first event. And I will tell you this, just as not to leave you on a downer on that, but there's a passage in Zechariah that says that there's coming a time when God will take the fast days of the fifth month, the sixth, the seventh, ninth month, and will make them feasts, celebrations. So even here, when you see the sadness of what took place, God doesn't leave us there. He wants to restore and to build us up and to have us be encouragement to one another as we move forward in his plan. Avinu Malkeno, our Father, our King, we thank you for all of your provisions, for all the examples we see in the scripture. We ask you to continue to work in us, to will and to do of your good pleasure, that we would be able to share with others, not chatter from our own heads, but the power of your word, the seed of faith that you put there for us to be able to encourage one another to walk in newness of life, to experience the deliverance power of God and not be shortchanged or sold a bill of goods or miss out on what it is that you have in store for us because somebody else sees it differently. Lord, allow that blue thread, that techelet, of your presence to permeate and interweave in every part of our life 
so that we are not left as a fringe element on the outskirts, but that we are a demonstration of your presence working in our lives. That we are getting the fringe benefits of walking in union with you. We thank you, O oh God, and ask that you would open up doors of opportunity. But Lord, don't just open up doors of opportunity. Prepare us to know what to do when those doors open up. Prepare us and equip us to be able to meet the needs of people and to see your hand bring deliverance for those who are bound. Set the captives free in Yeshua's name through the Messiah Yeshua. Amen. Let's all stand. And as Aaron blessed the people of Israel, so we bless one another with these words. Yivarecha Chodonai V'yishmarecha Yair Adonai Ponevelecha Vehunecha Yisa Adonai Ponevelecha Veyosem Lecha Shalom The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Sar Shalom, in the name of our Prince of Peace, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. And everyone agreed by saying amen and amen. Greet one another. Join us for Onik Shabbat at the Beth Zion House and extend the time of fellowship. There you're allowed to schmooze. There we can schmooze among each other because we're not in the midst of the commission to go out into the streets at the moment. So we'll have some time of fellowship. And uh, remember, next week, B and Shul will see you here next week as well. I'll be driving all the way back just to see you. So join us. <laughs>